Sixers lock all windows and doors. Kevin Nagandi, Philly guy, major Philly sports fan. I see you're representing already. Living the dream you had since you were 14, 17 plus years at ESPN, the first Indian American to appear on a national sports network. Temple University graduate, loving husband, father to three kids, all Philly sports fans. Good for you. <laughs> Who's got it going on more than you, bro? I'm asking you the question. Who's got it going on more than you? I'm very lucky. I'm very, very lucky. And and, and I'm also lucky to have a very supportive wife with my crazy. Uh, I married a, a woman from the SEC, so sh- we support her on Saturdays when she talks about her Florida Gators. But she's like, all right, you can get I, I'll give you the rest. You can have the rest. And, and I make sure we brainwash the kids here in Connecticut uh, during our time. So I, it's great to see you. Uh, Zoo, uh, you know how much I admire you. Appreciate the love, bro. Uh, back to your wife. Speaking of love, she is in the business, was in the business. She was in the business. We actually met uh, at the TV station I was at before I came to Sar- before I came to ESPN. It was in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, she was a, a reporter anchor. Um, then I got the gig in 2006. Uh, she was just a couple years in the business. Uh, she had big dreams, and and, and she moved up uh, a year later and was in the Hartford market, and she was fantastic at her job as a reporter, investigative reporter with the, their team, and she led a, she was their lead uh, reporter with that, and she was a fantastic anchor. And then she did that for a few years in Hartford at the NBC affiliate, and uh, then was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, I mean, I, local TV can burn you out. Uh, I think we've all gone through it uh, in some, some way, shape, or form. And then now she works at Connecticut Children's and she leads their corporate communications team for nearly a decade. She loves it. She does a a fantastic job and makes a bigger impact in that role than anything she did in front of the camera. So typically wives wives will critique their husbands, but she's uniquely qualified. So (laughs) does she get down and dirty with you sometimes and say, "Eh, you know what, Kevin, you could do this better, tweak that, that kind of thing? Yeah, you know, I love this question, Mark. Uh, yes, especially earlier in our relationship, it was her way of flirting with me in the newsroom. She'd be like, why, why do you have that? Because yeah, you know, when you're a local, you're a producer as well, right? So I would produce my my three uh, local newscasts every day at the 5, at the 6, and the 11. And she'd come in at like 5 o'clock and look at my rundown after she was just doing her story and be like, well, why are you leading with this? What, what's going on with that? And she would test me. Right. And I'd explain it to her and she'd like, OK, all right. Um, and that was great. Uh, and then there were times, Mark, which is fantastic to have a spouse, especially understanding TV when you can come home and be like and she's like, I understand uh, you didn't like that on camera. Uh, the director didn't roll the video at the right time. It didn't seem like you had the shot sheet or the highlight. Uh, what was going on in that interview? Like she immediately instinctively knew without me explaining anything or there were times where I'd come home and I'd be and I'd be like, "You have no idea." And she goes, "I have an idea why that was a great <laughs> show." You know, and when you can have that connection without explaining it to somebody, because right, I right. can't do that with some of my close buddies, because they'd be like, "Okay, yeah, great, right, all right, right. whatever." Uh, yeah, right. But when when we have a bad day in TV, it's not just five to eight people that know on the office floor or in a Zoom or in a cubicle. It's, uh, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands. And depending on what kind of show, it's millions of people that know you've had a bad day. And it's nice to come home to an environment where it's like, I get it. I understand. Um, and let's talk a little bit about it if you want to talk about it. So it, it, it's been helpful for me in the last 18 years with her. So let's take that a step further. Thousands, if not sometimes millions of people watching you. I know that I had this fear doing the Sixers that someday, some way, I might say something inappropriate, even if I didn't think I knew what I was saying. Do you have that fear? Uh, I I think I've had those fears uh, early in my career 
Uh, listen, I, coming from where I've come from, my, my family was very open uh, to say what you feel, be comfortable saying it. I would never hold back. I, I've got a very uh, uh, blue vocabulary. Uh, especially when I'm very passionate about things. So I was always aware of that and conscious about, okay, I've, I've got to be mindful of this. And then I think you could program your brain uh, to a certain extent. I, I think my biggest fears, Zoo, is when I go back home and, and I'm around my brother, I'm around my friends, um, and then I come back on my first day at work. I, I'm very deliberate of... Um, slang. I'm very mm -hmm, deliberate mm -hmm. of, you know, just dropping off something where it just comes naturally. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Especially when you go to temple in the environment, you know, you're just yourself, right? Uh, yeah, of course. So I I'm aware of it, but I don't think about it anymore because I've done a great job of kind of putting in a compartment and say, all right, now this is what I got to do. This is where I got to be. And this is how I got to move on. You know, my early on, I had a, I had a bad, I had a bad Philly accent early in the in the business. Tournament, water, crick. I was saying all that stuff at my first job. In Don't forget, Missouri. we're recording this on Monday. <laughs> Monday, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so whenever I was going back to my job in Kirksville, Missouri, after coming back home, they they that that first uh, couple of days, they were just killing me about tournament and why are you saying that? What, what's what's water? And I'm like, no, it's water ice. Like, what are you talking mm -hmm. about water? It, it's the water cooler, right? So I had to be really uh, conscious of that and uh, streamline that out of my uh, vernacular. But it's just. Every time you go home, it's just a natural thing, you know. Or you stop at a Wawa, you pick up a hoagie, and then all of a sudden you're you're dropping like you're, you know, in in Delco. So I, yeah, I've right. got to be conscious of that anytime I'm I'm coming back uh, on the air after being at home. You and I do have something in common in that when we were as young as 14, we knew what we wanted to do, and we actually ended up achieving it. Don't ask me how I did it, but <laughs> what attracted you to the business? I love storytelling. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've said this uh, countless times when recounting my passion of why I did this and what ultimately led me down this path. You know, it was my connection with my family and my dad. My dad came to America in uh, in the uh, late 60s. I was uh, the first person in my family born in America. So growing up, he would watch, you know, NFL games in the early 80s. And, and that was the way my dad and I could have a connection. Like my, my dad was very old school, work, work and work some more, loved cricket, but he loved football, loved mm. football. Mm. And as a six, seven, eight year old, it's like, you want to make a connection with your dad, right? While you're playing with your boys outside, your friends and stuff. But inside, when you're watching something, it's like, this is the one thing I know me and my dad agree on, right? Um, so he would yell at the TV screen at Ron Jaworski and Dick Vermeil as if they heard him. And I would defend those guys. I, I would be like, you can't get mad at Jaws. You just did that because I would consume all the stats and information as an eight-year-old, uh, you know, picking up the Philadelphia Sunday Inquirer from, you know, my yard to going through the comics and then making sure I have all this information and access so when I sat down with him, I could inform him. I loved informing him of what was going on, uh, especially when he watched sports because I didn't want my dad to look foolish. My brother was very much into sports. My mom completely supported me. And, and Zoo, I'll, I'll tell you a really funny story. Like in the basement, we had like a, a mini hoop. I would set up, you know, after doing all my homework, after playing with my friends from like seven o'clock on, I had a basketball tournament downstairs with this mini hoop music. And then I would go one on one in my own head with teams and build these teams up, you know, and I was always the Sixers, but I would do play by play of these games. And uh, I was probably 9, 10, 11, 12 years old doing this. Um, and think about this. This is the mid-80s, too. I, the Sixers were every – 83 team, still my favorite team of all time. So my mom at one point came down the steps and she goes, who are you talking to? I said, I'm, I'm doing play-by-play -play -play of the game. She goes, what do you mean? Well, who, but who are you talking to? I said, mom, if I don't do play-by-play -play of the game, then the games actually don't count. And she was like, I, I don't understand this reasoning. And I was like, no, I have to do the play-by-play -play of myself scoring against, you know, the Celtics and then record the win and then have a whole season. 
And that's where it started because I, I just loved it was always who's the voice of the game because they're the narrator of how I'm going to remember everything, you know. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and we were really lucky. Zoo, you were the voice. You were the voice of an entire generation. Harry Callis, who I, I was very lucky to be in the booth for, with when I was at Temple as an intern, was the voice of the Phillies, uh, multiple generations. Um, Merrill is the voice. I mean, I think Philadelphia fans are extremely lucky to grow up a, mm-hmm. in an environment over the last 30 to 40 years where we have these amazing voices that set the tone of our childhood and our memories mm-hmm. of big sporting events. Do you still have the sample you sent me when you were a Temple student that oh my play, God. play sample of the women's basketball? No, you know, I found a box that had some stuff and uh, there were some, multiple tapes. And let me tell you, I was like, oh, God, I'll keep these, but I'll never listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> never. And, and for the audience, for you guys to understand, uh, Zoo came in when I was a, a young um I think I was a sophomore calling, you know, maybe 19, 20 years old, calling Temple women's basketball. And uh, Liz Matt was our professor. You came in and spoke to us and you were so good to me. Uh, you asked me to send, you know, after I talked to you, you were like, yeah, send me, send me some of your, your, your tapes of women's hoops. And then you gave me a full critique. And I'll never forget that as a 19, 20 year old now through the years, I've had interns and it's, it's making sure you're aware. It's making sure you're providing feedback. It's making sure the people who really care about the craft, you're helping them out. I'll never forget it. I will never forget that advice and the advice you gave me. Uh, and I shared this, I think, last year uh, when we were at an event and you were in attendance and you were being honored that you gave me the idea of when you meet somebody, walk away on an index card, write the information of that conversation down, at least like the gist of it. So the next time you meet them, you would have a background of that information and then you were well informed. And then Basically, it, it helps you in communications and relationships down the road because that person may not remember. But if you remind them of a nugget that they shared with you, that goes a heck of a long way. And as look, this was 27, 28 years ago, Zoo, and it's still stuck with me. So the impact wow. that you've had, I'm just really lucky, man. I'm really lucky. Well, you're kind. And by the way, at that Pennsylvania Broadcasters Association event, you were honored, too. <laughs> Yeah. You weren't there. You weren't there as a member of the ticket buying public. <laughs> and uh, it was it was a humbling night. It was a, a fantastic night, especially with my family being there and to see your family and meet everybody. Um, nothing better. It was a temple celebration because uh, yes, it was. You it know, was great. Dean Boardman was there, yep. of course, from yep. uh, the Klein School of Communications at Temple. And uh, I love that guy. I love what he does for our university and for our specific mm-hmm. school. So it was a big celebration for all of us. Uh, uh, us owls. You, you've been mentioning your your family. Of course, your mom passed away several years ago. What was her impact on you? My biggest supporter, uh, the the person who believed in me from day one, um, the one who loved me regardless of uh, what I was dealing with, always had a positive thing to say to me. Um, she taught me how to be extremely savvy. Uh, she taught me also how to be extremely common sense smart but at the same time have emotional intelligence. Um, And she was, you know, when people come up to me, Zoo, or, you know, when we have these conversations about being the first of anything, uh, I always say that uh, I appreciate you guys or anybody saying something that, you know, I'm a role model, but like my ultimate role model was my mom. Like my mom came to America to support two boys and, and my dad, and then had to get her GED here. She grew up, I mean, ridiculously poor and came to America, understood what education was about, earned multiple degrees, took me to night school when I was eight, nine years old. And I would be sitting with her and watch her, you know, try to get her nursing degree and then to see her get her bachelor's and her master's. Mm -hmm. She just set the example. She changed the course of my career as well because she wanted me to go to Temple Zoo. And I was like, absolutely not. I'm not going to (laughs) Temple. I'm I'm gonna spread my wings. I'm gonna go to USC or Syracuse. I'm gonna be the next Bob Costas. And she was like, we had considered Temple. And I was like, nope. And um, my last two, two schools were USC and Syracuse. I committed to Syracuse. Uh, because I didn't think I was going to study at USC. 
Uh, zoo, I didn't study at Syracuse. I lasted one <laughs> semester because the weather was just horrendous. It was just <laughs> too cold for me, and I didn't like it. I wasn't going to get opportunity early in my career because there was just a thousand people that wanted to do the same thing I wanted to do. And she, on her own, uh, like, you know, at five foot nothing, went to North Philly in the early 90s, met with people, got the information, and then supported me and just said, hey, what about Temple? I've got mm. this information. I, there's a contact here. Maybe you should call. She had already done that without telling me. Mm. So she already had the foresight and, and knew that uh, Temple was the perfect school for me. And that's what moms do. They see things in a bigger picture, but at the same time, they do it in a way where they make it your own idea. And then you walk out and you're like, years later, you're like, yeah, mom, mom was the genius of this whole thing. Um, so the, the, the most amazing thing, Zoo, I'll say about my mom, too, is that she didn't understand what I was doing, yet she had so much support. And every single day that I was on ESPN, no matter what show it was, for 17, no, 16 years before she passed mm -hmm. away in May of 2022, she would send me a note, thank you for visiting me in my living room. And mm -hmm. I mean, that means the word, a DV, she would DVR things. You know, if she was sleeping or if I was on late, she'd demand my brother, can you tape this for me so when I get wake up, I can see this, taking naps, wake up. And, and every single time I was on the air, when you have that type of support for from your mom, it, it just means the world. Kevin, uh, as we cover athletes, we notice that they have a platform and they choose to use that platform to make statements about what it is that they truly believe in. A number of your ESPN colleagues have done the same and in some cases, quite frankly, have had to uh, pay the consequences for that. Um, how do you navigate that? Uh, the things that you believe in, the, the comments that you want to make, where do you draw the line? I think uh, there have been multiple instances where I have spoken out um, I think the previous administration had uh, done some massive cuts with Special Olympics, and uh, that is a dear uh, organization to my heart. And I spoke out because it was so disappointing on how it was being played out. There have been, you know, as a as a first generation, first born, I should say, uh, American. Um, there have been some stuff about immigration that I've spoken out about because it hurts me if, if, if my parents weren't given the opportunity to come to America like, you know, previous generations of uh, descents like Polish Americans and Italian Americans and Irish Americans. And, you know, we can go down the list through the years on how this country was built. Um, I wouldn't have the opportunities that I have. So I've spoken out about stuff that, that I'm passionate about. Now, Mark, I also believe there are certain things that, hey, what's the end game here? Um, because is it going to be made into something else? Um, are you uh, creating a controversy by saying something but, and not doing something? I think sometimes you could make statements and think, my job's done. I made the statement. Or you could feel something and actually do something about it and have a bigger impact. So I, I think there's certain moments you 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 pick and choose uh, not the cause you pick and choose when's the right time to say something, what's the right forum to say something, uh, and understanding that if you pick a certain forum, what kind of feedback and interaction you're going to get. Are you going to get uh, productive feedback? Are you going to get productive conversation? Um, there have been some things that have been said by. Uh, former colleagues that I took great offense to and I've gone to management and said, I don't agree with this. I also think that I'm not going to try to create a, oh, this per versus that person, but I'm, I'm telling, you know, my manager, I I'm, I'm this close to saying something publicly if this is not addressed. And uh, I, I think that when you can, when you could approach it in a way that is calm and effective you'll have greater results than emotionally being involved and then just losing it. And then basically you lose the whole point of the conversation. Mm -hmm. You lose the whole point of where you stand and why you do it. Um, but I also, you know, Zoo, there's a heck of a lot of things going on in this world. And there's a lot of people that I feel like that are, um, are facing the brunt of it unnecessarily uh, with a mob mentality um, on social media. It's just finding out 
how to be effective. It's finding out how to communicate clearly to the right people and how to provide support to those people without making it all of a sudden a controversy where it's like, oh, the statement instead of the actual action. I think too much we get into, hey, per this person said this instead of, wait, what's the actual topic? Because you can lose ground on the actual topic and the purpose of the topic and then make it into something else on who's saying it and why they're saying it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it's an interesting navigation. It's being smart about it. Uh, it's being effective when you say something um, and, and sticking up for causes that you really believe in when you have to, to do it. Let's take it a step further. Uh, Stephen A. Smith, uh, Charles Barkley, Pat McAfee, Minna Kimes on the distaff side. Uh, these people, when they say something, they inhale. And as soon as they exhale and get ready to say something, we're like, what are they saying now? Why should we care? Well, it's a good question. Uh, I think because they have a connection to certain people. Uh, they have a connection to people that identify through them. You just brought up four specific people that, that transcend past uh, the content that they're talking about daily, right? They, they trans, uh, transcend past the sports conversation. Um, that they have an impact, I think, well past the, hey, what's the score and what are we going to do about the uh, – uh, a LeBron debate or a Cowboys thing or what's going on with, you know, Shohei Otani. Like, I think those, those voices carry a ton of weight that, that, that are amplified as well. Um, and sometimes distorted for clicks. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then I think I'll, I'll say this specifically because you brought up Mina. When Mina talks, I listen regardless of whatever the conversation is, because I also know that where Mina's coming from is often a, a brilliant point of view that has been well thought out, that has factual backing behind it with an opinion. And that off, quite often Mina is going to say something that has some, that's data driven and, and it's processed and consumed and then put out there in a way that I can better understand it and be smarter after every conversation. And I think that is in many different levels. Uh, I mean, she is an, an Asian American like myself. So her viewpoint too, that I will, I will listen to because I'm like, she understands from a specific viewpoint that, you know what, I will take it and say, yeah, I, I look at it this way as well. Um, so specifically when you talk about certain people, I, I think they carry a ton of weight in the space that goes well past, uh, sports. You know, I, I, the most amazing thing you brought up, Chuck, Chuck, Chuck's incredible. What, what's amazing about Chuck is Chuck can say something that no one else can say and Chuck can do whatever he wants and Chuck will offend 50% regardless but nine out of 10 times, you're like, I'm thinking about what Chuck just said, because Chuck has a way of just getting right to it, cutting through it with no BS. And at the same time, it's from his viewpoint. So sometimes I listen to Chuck and I'm like, that's his viewpoint. I don't agree with it. But man, I'm glad he said what he said and how he said it, because then it just cut through the BS and the garbage. And now I can think about it ref reflectively and sometimes laugh at it. And I think sometimes Chuck's Chuck gives us the excuse to laugh at certain things that we wouldn't normally laugh about, especially in this current stage that we're at in society. Kevin McHale used to say when they were both playing that Charles Barkley says what we're all thinking, we just can or won't say it. But I, I, I wanted to address a key word in um, your last comment, clicks. Yeah. What what are clicks doing to our business The the need, the desire, the want, the necessity to get clicks and doing things just to get clicks true or not valid or not uh, where are we going with all this it's watering down everything of true value right it's watering down how we consume things um you know i think you and me uh have a filter uh through the years of experience right we could filter through okay all right I mean, that's that's that like famous meme that's bait i'm not clicking it uh you know um, what concerns me is how it's consumed by, you know, my 11 year old boy, my nine year old boy, how are they consuming, you know, this, uh, disinformation or misinformation 
uh, because it's just, hey, I want you to click on this, right? So what's amazing is I I fight through it daily. You know, we, we restrict their social media intake, but at the same time, they, they're still, you know, kids that are surrounded by friends that are surrounded by, you know, parents who allow their kids to have access to a lot more things. So, you know, at home, they'll come home and they'll ask, no, oh, such and such said this. Is he right? And I'll be like, well, where'd you get that? How'd you get that? Let's talk about it. No, it's not. This is not happening. This this that didn't really happen. Or let me explain why. Why did you think this this player stinks? Who told you that? Oh, well, I saw it on this. Show me where you got it. Let's look at it. Uh, and then I find out who says it. And I'm like, look at this person. This person's not in the business of understanding sports. And they're just saying it because look what you just did. You clicked on it. And now they got what they wanted. Right. So I, I think the issue you and I will have in this business and anybody that's in this business for a while is making sure that facts are presented, data is provided with a backing and understanding and and also an explanation. And too many times there are no explanations. It's just let's fly off the handle. There are a lot of people that can understand that this is an entertainment business, and there's a lot of people who do not understand that. It's just deciphering, okay, what's real, what's entertaining, what's um, what's factual. And many times, I bring this up again with my kids, many times I make sure I educate them because I do not want them to then be the ones spreading misinformation specifically in a sports background. Like, I'm like, hey, you, mm -hmm. you can't go out there and tell your buddies this. Like, this is not true. Understand that. They, they may think it's cool because somebody said it. That doesn't mean it's true. Right. And it's kind of deciphering through that with, you know, the next generation of sports fans who are in their teens, early 20s. It's, it's just making sure they understand that, hey, don't get, uh, you know, sucked into the, uh, the, the daily um, scuttlebutt. Yeah. Well, listen, I know you're already a great parent because you've made your kids Philly sports fans. We're going to talk <laughs> about that. And of course, we got to talk Sixers because that's what our podcast here is all about. I just want to put a capper on what you just said by saying this. And this might be a little foreboding, but because of this, I mean, it's a, it's a great it's a great tool. But because of this. Yeah. Um, uh, anybody can do anything and make a brand and a name for themselves for the right or the wrong reason. I don't know what the solution or the answer is or how we deal with that, but let's move on. Yes. Uh, I want to do our halftime segment. Then we're going to talk about uh, being a Sixers fan and your family and all of that. All right, we're going to do the six pack here. So this is fast. All right. Uh, okay. This is not something you're, I want you to think about or research. Okay. Got I'm going it. to give you a choice, choice between two things and you have to pick. Ready? So, you ever get to a game and your view's nothing close to what you thought it would be? Listen, I get to buy seats now, too. No freebies. So, I'm teaming up with Game Time. They have got killer last-minute deals, flash deals. You could check out views from all seats in the venue, and they've got your back with the lowest price guarantee. Listen, if you find tickets for less in the same section and row... Game Time credits you 110% of the difference. They show your total up front. No surprises at checkout. Buying tickets takes two seconds, a couple of taps, and you're done. Philly, let's change the game. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the app, create an account, use the code ZOO for $20 off your first purchase. Remember, terms apply. Redeem the code ZOO, Z-O-O, for your $20 discount at GameTime.co. Philly cheesesteak or Philly soft pretzel? Oh, can I say Philly chicken cheesesteak? Oh, you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> cheesesteak, cheesesteak. Thank you. Center City or South Jersey? Center City. Gritty or Philly fanatic? fanatic the best me meek miller hall and oats oh you got temple guys involved in this uh, yeah, that's right uh, uh, come on let's go uh, hall and oats, hall and oats. <laughs> thank you dr j or Allen iverson dr. throwback j dr j Li liberty bell or rocky steps liberty bell all right i'm going to delve into my music library i'm going to pick five artists you tell me if you have them in your library or not are you ready yes let's do it foo fighters Yes. Pat Metheny. 
No. Johnny Cash. Yes. Fat Boy Slim. Yes. Marvin Gaye. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, I was a, I was a little afraid you wouldn't have any Marvin. Who are who are some of your musical go tos? Wow. So um, I'm a, I'm a '90s hip hop guy. Uh, of course, '90s grunge. So I'm dating myself. So I I love you too. I love you know Pearl Jam or you know the whole Seattle scene. Chris Cornell. Anything Soundgarden does. At the mm -hmm. same time, if you pop in Dre. You pop in uh, Biggie, Snoop, Biggie, uh, Biggie. Yes, okay. absolutely. Tupac and, and okay. LL Cool J. You, you got me like going through the whole thing. I'm all into that. But at the same time, like Marvin Gaye, I'm a lot of uh, R&B in the late 80s. I love the, the late 80s, Quiet Storm, the 90s. My brother raised me on Van Halen. So when, when we hear Eddie... You know, an eruption. I'm stopping what I'm doing. I'm playing it for that my kids and explaining the entire background of what that is. Uh, so I, I'm a good mixture of all of that. You know, and, and you mentioned Foo Fighters. So like, I can I can jam out to anything and everything. It just depends on the mood that I'm in. And I, I will add, Guns and Roses. When you listen back, uh, use your illusion one and two. Like it, they were incredible, like mm. incredible. Mm. And uh, mm. I can go mm. back to all that stuff with Axel when he had his voice. All right, let's go back to 1975. You were eight when the Sixers won the title in 1983. Do you remember that team? I do. I loved everything about that team. I remember the run. Uh, I remember my parents taking me, you know, it was probably, I was trying to think about it, 82, 83, 84, when we played the Celtics in the playoffs. And I remember going to the Spectrum and we were in the nose, nose, nosebleeds. And I remember there was a Celtics fan in the, uh, while we were going all the way up those steps climbing. And I was just so appalled that somebody in Philadelphia allowed somebody in Celtics green to be <laughs> in the arena. I was so angry about it. Uh, I still have issues with Harold Katz and how they, you know, dismantled that team and sending Moses to the Wizards or the Bullets back then and just how it just tore apart the team with the Roy Hinson trade, um, you know, and, and how you had the number one pick and how it was everything was, you know, built in. Well, it was, I think, the number two pick because the Len Bias went number one and, mm -hmm. and we had the, the opportunity to take Brad Doherty. So, yeah, the 80s Sixers, they, that was my that was my live and die team. Mo Cheeks, Dr. J, you know, um, Ivoroni, Bobby Jones, like Clint Richardson. Like I was all in on that team. And then they had a young Charles Barkley that they drafted. And of course they could have built that entire franchise around long term. Uh, we won't talk about what happened in 92. Oh boy. Well, I, I will say this in defense of, of Harold Katz, and I know he takes a lot of heat for breaking the team up, but 84, 85, 86, I mean, they had their opportunities. They never got back to the finals. And I guess he just felt, you know what? Doc was the centerpiece. He was getting older. Bobby Jones was being phased out. Yeah. Moses Malone, I guess, was already in his 30s. So I think that was his thinking. But besides that, let's go to 2001. Uh, just an unbelievable year uh, for so many different reasons. Allen Iverson somehow leading the Sixers to the NBA Finals. Your thoughts on that team and your memories from it? It was an incredible team. I was in uh, Sarasota, Florida at the time, so I'm a 26-year-old. Love the run. Uh, I love the buildup. I also love – I loved it. I knew eventually Larry Brown and, and AI were basically the same person. Mm. And that they would finally see each other and see the light years later. It just broke my heart with all the the, the clashing. But uh, Larry was hard on his stars. You know that more than anybody. And Alan, Alan got whatever Alan wanted. Uh, but Alan needed Larry Brown. You know, he needed, you know, Pat Croce. He needed those guys. And the way they built that team and what Alan did specifically to carry that team. And, you know, the whole Vince Carter game. Like, all that stuff. I uh, there was a special team. How it was built with Dikembe, you know, the Sports Illustrated article, uh, the cover. Um, I love that they made the trade, and it, it was it was it was great. It was especially after the you know after the Dano Barros years and how mm. they, you know the Sharon rights and what that team went through in the mid nineties, mm. uh, coming out of the Barkley trade. Oh gosh, um, it was perfect, perfect for that team, perfect for the city. I thought. And it still breaks my heart that uh, how it played out because there was no way there was no way they were going to win four games against uh, Shaq and Kobe in their prime. Well, they could have helped themselves. And by the way, that was the second of three straight titles for that Lakers squad. But you might recall last game of the season. Now the Sixers are really banged up, so the thinking was let's rest our starters 
give them a break before the playoffs. Like a 16-win Chicago team or something like that comes into Wells Fargo Center. Uh, Could have easily been a victory and secured home court for the Sixers in the finals. you think that would have made it? They eventually lost, by the way, and of course the Lakers had home court. Do you think that would have made a difference? No. Uh, and, And I think that it was meant to be because of game one. Like, I think when you look back, I think everybody's like, oh, yeah, they lost. But game one is etched in in stone as an all-time game. You know, the step over, of course, Allen doing what he did, the shock in L.A. uh, That was our Super Bowl. (laughs) So I I don't know if if they had home court advantage, we would have had a moment like that. That that, that moment was unbelievable. And I know Mm -hmm. people at home are like, oh, it's a loser mentality. You know, you, you, you you only won one game. Man, that game, I think anybody that was alive and watched that game and saw what Allen did on the court and shocking that team in L.A., that was a, that was an all-time, that was a top five, I think, Sixers moment, regardless, just because what they were up against. I mean, it was it was literally David versus Goliath. And, and, and once Kobe just figured it out and just said enough is enough, Allen could only do so much. And, and we know what, the way that team was constructed. You know, if, if Allen wasn't hitting his shot, Good luck finding offense consistently the rest of the series. Of course, that was an era where 85 points would get you a win, but that's not <laughs> that's neither here nor there. How about the current edition of the Philadelphia 76ers? Can they win a title as currently constituted? Do they need to make a few tweaks? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think they need to make a couple tweaks. They, they need – listen, uh, their run right now, Joel's playing – uh, he's playing better right now than he did even last year. Um, what's amazing about this too is they're blowing out bad teams. They're they're not playing to the level of the competition. You can also do some load management, right? Because then he plays three quarters and then sits down, right? Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. He's determined. I think Tyrese is the flowing of the offense is so much better because it's just not stagnant. Nick Nurse was the coach this team needed. Um, and one thing that I love that Daryl did was he collected assets and flexibility. It's hard to say this team can make a run without knowing all the proper parts until after after the deadline, right? Until, you know, you can pick up a couple guys. But, like, right now it's just fun. I, you know, I was really, really as upset after Game 6 and 7 uh, in, in the mm-hmm. Celtics series. I, mm-hmm. I was speechless after Game 6. Mm-hmm. And uh, Game 7 – Game seven was really, really tough to the point where I was like, I, I, I can't finish this game. I'm going to go work out and feel good about myself because halfway through that game, I was like, I know where this is going in Boston. The problem is, is that Milwaukee got better. Boston got better. And those teams, those two teams got better for playoff runs. Did we get better for the playoff run? We won't know, I think, till Daryl figures out what to do with the assets that we have and maybe moving a contract that you can right now um and then we can kind of decide who's 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 going to pair up with this team the one thing they've got muscle and they've got depth which this team had not had previously with joel and i'll say one other thing man zoo you know this more than anybody i we just can't have another freak in, in, injury with joel and it always always seems to happen in april mm-hmm. and it just lingers and then carries through whether you're he's getting hit in the face or he's falling on the on the wrong part when the knees tweaked it, we just we just can't have that because if they they need him 100% the entire postseason to have the run that they want to have. But I mm-hmm. what I love about the team, I love Tyrese. I, I just absolutely love his energy, man. He is the mm-hmm. darling of the city because he gets the city and he brings the energy. And that's all Philadelphia fans want. Somebody who's passionate about what they, they do each and every night and has a joy. Tyrese gives this team and I think this fan base a ton of hope. And that's all we want. Now, I mentioned earlier, you made your kids Philly sports fans. You live in Connecticut. Will you drive to a game, go to the game, and then drive all the way back? I've done it multiple times. I've done it Sunday night football. We'll drive down. We'll drive back. I've done it multiple times with the kids, without the kids. Um, They have really adapted well. Perfect example, the the Dolphins Sunday night Eagles game. Uh, we went there for that game, and the whole goal, my, my wife were debating, hey, do we drive back? We drove down. That was a disaster mm-hmm. of a drive. Mm. Uh, it took us six hours because mm. I, my, I timed it out really, really, really bad. Uh, and I'm really an expert in timing out a drive. Um, so 
We decided to stay that morning when I woke up and I said, we've got to go. We've got to go to game six and watch the Phillies close out the Ash. I mean, the Astros shoot. There's a hope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll watch yeah, yeah. the Phillies close out the Diamondbacks. And we figured it out. We did it. And then literally we drove back home that night after that game. So I've done it multiple times. The kids are great. They're, they're great at adapting. They don't know any different. Um, they have great memories. Uh, I, I grew up with my family t- making me travel everywhere. I went to India so many times as a kid, London, California, Niagara Falls, everywhere. And it just made me adaptable and aware of, hey, got to do this. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, and I think it's helped me in this business when I travel around for 20 plus years. I think my kids are at that point too. But we get mm-hmm. to a point, Zoo, where I'm like, all right, we're, we're, this is not worth it. I can't justify it. We're not going to do this. We're not going to do that. But in certain moments, it's like, it's worth it. Let's go. And um, and they, they're diehard. My, my 11-year-old is such a diehard. I have to actually talk him off the ledge multiple times. Oh, man. <laughs> and I'd be like, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about this. And I'll explain it to you why. Boom, 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 boom. Um, my nine-year-old loves it uh, because he just uh, he, he, he gets into it all, but he handles it really well. My seven-year-old, you'll love this, Zoo. My seven-year-old daughter, big, big Taylor Swift fan. Big Taylor Swift fan. When she found out that Taylor was dating the wrong Kelsey, <laughs> she was so mad. It's really the right Kelsey. The other one's married, but go I ahead. know, I know. But, but stop, stop liking Taylor Swift for a week, which is saying a lot for a seven-year-old girl, and now despises the Chiefs. Dis- and I'm like, we don't have anything against the Chiefs. Despises the Chiefs. Um, so I, I, I love that. And I appreciate, uh, I appreciate their, their passion because listen, it, it's part of the DNA. No, I love your passion. I see it on ESPN. You're not afraid to say you're a Philly sports fan. Am I missing it? Do, do your other colleagues from other towns who root for other teams, do they do it as much as you? My, my co-anchor on the 6 PM, L Duncan is unabashed Braves fan, Hawks fan. She loves the Broncos and the Georgia Bulldogs. So she has met my match here when it comes to the conversation that we've had on the set and the debates and the bets that we've had to settle and me winning the last two postseasons with the Phillies beating the Braves and rubbing it in and and her and the Hawks knocking my team out, the Sixers, of course, and that collapse uh, that we had a few years ago. So there are some guys, you know, you know who gave me the freedom to do that? Stuart Scott, the late great mm. Stuart Scott and his passion for North Carolina and his banter back and forth with Van Pelt, who, lo- who loves Maryland. Van Pelt's not shy about his, his passion for Washington, the commanders and all that. Those guys gave me the freedom. And then, you know, I got a little bit bigger. I wasn't shy about Temple. And it just continued to grow. Uh, But I will always say this. I'll be the first one to criticize any Philadelphia team on the air. I'll be the first one. I don't hide it. I think I've rubbed some some people wrong uh, through the years when teams are bad in Philly in these organizations. But I'll be also the first one to stick up for our town, to stick up for our teams if I feel like, hey, we're not being discussed enough factually. Uh, but I will also say that if the Cowboys whooped our butt like they did last week, yeah. But I also add that, hey, the Eagles didn't stop them, and the Eagles could have scored on three specific drives if they didn't fumble. Mm. I will make sure it's backed up with some facts and conversation. So mm-hmm. we have some more fun on social media um, because it's just – I think it's entertaining. But I also think, too, it gives people who watch – a kind of like a secret look under the hood that we are passionate fans as you guys are as well. I'm going to be respectful and give the Cowboys credit when it's due. Dak deserved to be in the MVP conversation. Let's not forget who Dak and the Cowboys had faced though through the years, uh, through the weeks building up to that conversation. Right. I'll be, I won't be shy about that, but at the same time, I will stick up for our team if I feel like somebody's, you know, downplaying. You know, Kate Perk, Kendrick Perkins will always talk about Joel Embiid, especially last year during the MVP run. Him and I will have a heck of a lot of fun with that. And then he'll bring up, Kev, I know I'm talking about your boy. I didn't say that. Kate Perk did. <laughs> and then I can back it up, right? <laughs> so I don't, I don't bring it up into the faces of our analysts. It's our analysts who enjoy the banter back with me. And then they give me the freedom to say, yes, we can bring this up. But I, I'm never one of those guys that says, hey, you need to talk about this. I, I, I think that's not fair for the audience because the audience doesn't want to consume it that way. 
A couple other things about the future that I'm going to let you go. Uh, the iPhone, the Internet. Now we have artificial intelligence. Yeah. Who knows where that's going to go? Uh, what's the future of our business um, and fans consuming sports content? Where is it all headed? I think it's all, of course, clearly on our phone. Everything's on our phone. Uh, AI is extremely scary, especially if it's not regulated. The as somebody who grew up collecting Sports Illustrated um, issues and has multiple boxes through decades of stuff. Just the news of AI and the background of people, you know, being impersonated and their writing stories, the, you know, the automated stuff that, that is scary stuff, Zoo. Mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. just in sports, but in our world. Right. Um, I think the one thing that I see, and they opened up a Pandora's box, all these professional leagues, the access to betting and how it's embraced easily everywhere. Not, you know, people are going to, well, your network does it. Well, I think our network waited and waited. Now we see it. It's basically all consuming everywhere else. I think the problem you're going to have is what you're going to see now specifically is when you're watching a game, betting lines are going to pop up on your phone. Uh, whether it's, you know, ESPN, Bet, DraftKings, you know, you know, um, whatever uh, mm -hmm. other Points companies bet, are going to be there. And then mm -hmm. it's going to be easily, oh, I, on this play? I'm going to bet this or this half, this quarter, I'm going to do this. Um, I think that's going to be, that's going to be an interesting um, landscape that is not really na navigated well by people that you could specifically trust, especially if it bleeds into college athletics. We saw the scandal with the, you know, some of the athletes at Iowa and Iowa state. And we're seeing that with NFL players, you know, what is the fine line, you know, and, <laughs> Uh, they're following the rules in their mind. And now, oh, no, you're not. You know, like, who do you trust on? Hey, this game didn't turn out the way it did, right? I, it, Barry, here's an example. Uh, and it's it's a mindless example, but it's like, oh, my God. Can you imagine the controversy? The line of the Patriots-Chiefs game was 10 and a half. The Chiefs had the ball and had the opportunity to score in the closing minute. And they kneeled. And they won by 10. <laughs> <laughs> How do I know it's the line is 10 and a half? Because it was all over my social media and people talking about it. I didn't think about it while I was watching the game. But now it's playing a role into, uh-oh. And I think if you see big game, you know, stakes on the line with a lot of money, I think people then start to think, Hey, what's the credibility of this game and this performance when we see how much money is on the line? And I think now we're bleeding into that more and more. And that's scary down the road of where we're going. I'm going to leave it right there, brother. Kevin Nagandi, ESPN, Philly Suburbs, Temple Maid, father, husband. You continue to have it going on, my brother. Thank you so much for joining me. I greatly appreciate it. My pleasure, Zoo. You're the best, man. Much love to you. Check out our friends over at Philadelphia Sports Nation, a local Philadelphia sports site covering your favorite teams across blogs and social media. PHLSportsNation.com. Philadelphia Sports Nation. PHL Sports Nation. Enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience. Hey guys, thanks for listening to this episode of Fresh 24. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts.